So the time has come to look at the glue that actually makes this work. Talking, we've been talking about there's classes, instance variables, and so forth in the Ruby world. There's tables and columns and rows and SQL in the database world. And we have to glue those things together. And active record is a design pattern. Again, there's that word that uh, serves as a way to think about what do you do when you have data structures that you want to store in a database, but you also want to have those data structures essentially behave as instances of a class in your programming language. How do you glue those things together in a way that is a nice abstraction? And active record is the dominant design pattern that Rails uses to do this. So what does the Ruby side of a model, so to speak, look like? And, you know, from, look at it from the Ruby side of the world. How does a model look? Um, really, it's just a plain old class that happens to inherit from application record. And a lot of magic fun things happen in application record because it connects a model to the database and it provides database CRUD operations on that model without you ever writing a single line of SQL. Um, as we mentioned, because of convention over configuration, the database table name is derived from the model name. And momentarily, we'll show how these tables are actually set up in the first place. But for now, let's just take it on faith that the tables exist. And the database table column names, as we're going to see in a moment, basically become the getter and setter method names for model attributes. This is really deep. And that's my cue for you to listen up. When we did our simple classes uh, and we were just sort of introducing Ruby, and we said, well, in Ruby, all of the class uh, instance variables are only visible inside the class. And so the only way to expose them outside the class is to define getter methods and setter methods. And we could either define those explicitly by writing out the method, or we could use this cool shortcut, at your underscore accessor, that is really just a way of writing the methods for us at runtime with less code. So now we're going to take that concept a step further. Because now, if the idea is that the database table is going to be the way that we store model state, that means that when we, for example, are updating the value of an attribute of our model, we can't just set an instance variable because instance variables are ephemeral. Remember, every time, you know, HTTP is stateless. Every time our app gets a request, basically a new copy of the interpreter could be fired up. So those variables that the app, the instance variables that are attributes of the class have to be stored in the database in the corresponding columns. And now you can start to see why this idea of complete data hiding and having getters and setters is really powerful. Because now we can say, all right, when I define a class that has a certain attribute, certain type of instance variable, I'm going to define the getters and setters for it, not to just manipulate an underlying variable in Ruby, but also to do something with the database. So getting, the, getting an instance of the class is going to mean populating those instance variables from the current values that are stored in the database for that instance. When I want to update, like make a permanent change to instance variables of the class, what I really need to have happen is that has to go to the database and be stored there forever. So this is the basic idea behind how Active Record works. So let's do a uh, quick demo. OK, so I've created a very simple, even simpler than Rotten Potatoes movie app that I call Move Over. And the uh, repo will be in the course notes. You can actually run all this code yourself and do all the things that I'm going to do. Um, I'm actually not going to fire up the app interactively, meaning I'm not going to run a server process that lets my web browser talk to the app. Instead, I'm going to run Rails console, which basically loads all of Rails and all of my app and all of my code into memory, but it doesn't actually start an interactive server. I have taken the liberty in my simple little app of creating a movies table, and I have populated it with two or three different movies. And the first thing that I can look at, I'm going to explain as I go, if I say movie.all, by the way, capital movie, because it's capitalized, you know that it is almost overwhelmingly likely to be a what kind of thing in Ruby. Yeah, it's a class, right? And this is just part of the Ruby naming rules that we went over very early in the course. And because I'm calling movie.all, uh, presumably that means that all is a class method or an instance method of the movie class. It's a class method, right? Because I'm, the receiver of all is the class itself, as opposed to any particular instance of it. So if I say movie.all, I get this sort of illegible mess. 
But happily in the Ruby console, if I say pretty print movie.all, I get something a lot more readable. Um, in particular, I get something that if you're sort of squinting at it from afar, let's see, well, there's left square bracket here. Usually in Ruby, that means an array. And what's inside the array? Well, there is a whole bunch of objects that Ruby says have these different attributes. So I'm going to ask you a deliberately misleading question because I would like for someone to say, that was the wrong question. You should have asked this other thing instead. My deliberately misleading question is, what is the class of the value that was just returned by saying movie.all? The question that matters is not, what is the class of the returned thing? The thing that matters is the return thing quacks like an enumerable. You can do everything to it that you would expect to do to an enumerable. And one of the standard things you can do to an enumerable in Ruby is, for example, you can call each on it, and you can pass an anonymous lambda and do a bunch of stuff with it. So for example, I, let me make life a little bit more convenient by assigning this to an actual variable. And now I can expect And what about these attributes? Well, let's try that. OK, if we read around all of the cruft. So what did I do? Did I walk through an array? No, I iterated through an enumerable. You don't care if it's an array, but you care that it quacks like an array. And for each element of the array, what did I do? Well, I assumed the existence of an accessor that corresponded to one of the accessors that I saw listed when I got the movies back. So what is this telling me? That what's going on under the hood here, right? Let, let us sort of demystify the magic. When I said movie.all, that created a query to the database that actually returned something that quacks like an enumerable of all the movies. Why does it matter that I say it just quacks like an enumerable? Suppose there were a zillion movies. It would not be terribly efficient to return an enormous data structure that has zillions of, in, of uh, instances in it, because you might only be interested in using a few. But it would make sense to create a piece of code that each time you say, give me the next one, can lazily go fetch the next batch. All of which is invisible because all you care about is it quacks like an enumerable, right? So that enumerable consists of a bunch of what appear to be data structures that have these attributes. I can call these getters on the attributes. The getters are defined such that once that collection was returned from the database, Ruby internally converted those things to movie objects. In fact, if I grab one of these, and let's just grab the first one because, oops, so movies.first. Why is it OK to say dot .first? Because dot .first is a collection method that is mixed into all enumerables. And I already know that the thing I got back from Rails quacks like an enumerable. Let's just ask, what kind of thing is this? OK, well, it, look at this. We actually get back the database schema for what a movie is. It has an ID. Why does it have that? Because in the database, everything has to have a primary key. And in Rails, by convention, it's always called ID, and it's an integer. Movie has a title, which is a string. It has a rating, which is a string. And it has a release date, which is a date. So here's another cool thing. I have two questions, and you tell me which of the questions you care about more. Question number one is, if you actually looked in the database, what is the format that a date is stored? Like, is it stored as? year dash month dash day? Is it stored as some other weird thing? That's question number one. Question number two is, what does a date-like thing look like in Ruby? And what can you do to a date-like thing in Ruby? Which question do you care about more? Yeah, the second, I mean, as a programmer, you're not writing the database. You're writing an app that manipulates models that happen to be stored in a database. It'd be nice if you mostly didn't have to worry about the fact that Database A stores dates in a particular format, but database B stores them in some somewhat different format. What you care about is that when you retrieve a date from the database, it has a predictable form. And if you store a date in the database, regardless of how you created it, once it gets stored in the database, it'll do the right thing for that database. And indeed, that's another part of the glue that Active Record provides. So if I, if I ask, uh, let's see, I got the, of the first movie, if I ask, Here's what its release date is. And what kind of a thing is that? Well, not surprisingly, Ruby has a built-in class in one of its libraries called date. And as you might expect, that class lets you construct and manipulate dates in interesting ways. Like you can subtract one date from another and get the number of days in between. You can 
project a date into the future. You can convert a date and time depending on different time zones. So in your side of the world, right? Remember this kind of a, a Ruby side of the world and the database side of the world. In the Ruby side of the world, when you declare that something in the database is a date, anytime you read it, you will get a Ruby date object. And you can manipulate the heck out of the Ruby date object, store it back into the database, and the right thing happens for the database. So this is the essence of the active record design pattern. It's a record because each database row is thought of as being a model instance. That's what we call record-oriented data storage, right? Each row is one record. The records are independent of each other, but they all have the same schema. They all have the same set of attributes. They all share the same logic. It's active record because the act of updating something in memory and then how do you sort of propagate that to the database in a way that when you pull it back, it will have the same format. That's the active part, right? There is active code that is managing the mapping between how things look in the Ruby world and how things look in the database world. Well, you know, we said, how do we normally find things? We would normally want to find things based on some criteria. So what if I say, you know, movies for kids is a movie where the rating is PG, let's just say. Before I press return, what is, based on what you've seen so far, what statement can you probably make about the thing that's going to be returned, the value that's going to be returned from doing this call? And I'm going to give you a strong hint, which is that in all likelihood, there's going to be more than one movie that happens to match this criterion, even in my tiny little simple database. What is very likely to be true about the result of doing this? It will quack like an innumerable, right? Because there's probably, and by the way, if there's only one movie that happens to match, it will still quack like an innumerable that can only return one element. Because this way it's consistent, right? You, you don't have to worry about whether there's one match, zero, if, you know, if zero matches, will quack like an innumerable that has no elements. The first time you call each, you'll just get nothing, right? It's just like falling off the end of an array. So if we do that, OK, well, let's see. What do we get? What if we pretty print that object? OK, well, we got two things that matched. But here's a thing that's kind of neat. Remember that this expression that I just got, how did I get this? Well, I did this active record call, which by now you probably have figured out. Somewhere in the implementation of where is the logic that sort of creates the SQL query for you. But there's a cooler thing you can do than that, because suppose uh, now I, uh, I've, I've narrowed it down to movies that are appropriate for kids, but now I want to narrow it down to movies that are, I don't know, actually fun to watch or something. This reveals something about my cynical nature as a movie watcher. But so kids movies that are also good are kids movies where, let's say, the release date is somewhat more recent. So I'm going to say it's between, uh, I don't know, uh, let's make sure I get my parentheses right because I don't want the demo to embarrassingly fail. Okay. Oops, forgot to close the final paren. Okay, what happened here? This is one of these sort of subtle things, and again, this is a you know perk up moment. Um, originally, when I said the thing that is assigned to kids quacks like an enumerable, yes, it does quack like an enumerable. We can cycle through it with each and so on, but it does ever so much more because notice what I just did. Um, it is itself a relation. Right? If you come from the database world and I ask you, uh, what is the result of executing a where in SQL? The correct sort of database terminology is the result is a relation. It is a representation of the things that might match that criterion. It is not yet necessarily the materialized list that you can step through and, and paint by number and do all kinds of things with. In some sense, it doesn't exist until you start looking at the elements, for example, by using each on them. So actually, I can take my existing relation which specifies a constraint on a table, and I can augment it with another constraint. And in fact, if I build up a whole bunch of these, the only time a query is actually generated and sent to the database is the first time I ask for one of the results. And that is a really, really cool thing. Because it means that you can essentially build up quite complicated queries, and Rails will synthesize the efficient query for you only at the moment that you actually ask for the first result. It's called lazy evaluation. We'll see a lot more of it. And by the way, what is the result of kids and good? 
It's a thing that quacks like an enumerable, although in this case, it's an empty relation. I should have specified a better constraint. So what have we done so far? We have looked at methods on the movie collection. Uh, we looked at all, which just returns all the movies. We noticed that the return value of something that can match zero or more rows in a table is a thing that quacks like an enumerable. You can cycle through it. You can do further filtering on it and so forth. I showed that you can actually chain these things. You can actually build up relations over multiple where clauses. And the only time that a query actually is synthesized and happens is when you ask for the first element that sort of matches the entire built-up result. One thing we haven't done yet, though, is try to change the attributes of one of these objects. So we still have the object that co corresponds to our first movie. And suppose that I say, let me give it a different rating. So I am assuming the existence of a setter method, right? Just like when I assumed the existence of a getter method before to look at the attributes, I am now assuming that there is a setter method that will allow me to set the attributes of an object that I've retrieved. OK, well, it seems to have been successful. And if I now look at first, sure enough, it looks like the in-memory object now has a different value for the rating. But wait, suppose I say, And by the way, this movie has ID1, as you can see from the database. So I'm just going to grab a copy of it, right? So this is actually going to, this, notice what I'm doing here. I am explicitly using Active Record to go out to the database and retrieve it, even though I already have a copy of it, retrieving it again. And what happens when I retrieve it? Lo and behold, it's still R. This is important, OK? I have the database. I have in-memory. I have used where or find or some other method to get an in-memory copy of the thing that's in the database. I have manipulated my in-memory copy by making some changes to its attribute values, but I have not yet explicitly said, I want these changes persisted. So it's active record, but it's not like hyperactive record, right? It is not the case that every time I make a modification to the in-memory object, that that is automatically propagated to the database. I have to say when I'm done. And most of the time, believe me, this is what you want, right? Because often you're going to make a series of changes and updates. You're going to manipulate the object in a bunch of ways. And then finally, when you're done with all that, now you want that updated version to go back to the database, which I can do if I say first.save, right? And by the way, if you're a database person, you will notice a lot of the database logging coming out will tell you when it's initiating a database transaction. We'll get back to why that's useful in a little bit. So. Just changing the attributes of the in-memory object is not enough, right? I have to explicitly reflect that change back to the database. And now, if I once again reload it from the database, now I have the correct value that I had reset it to. So this is the standard pattern for manipulating a model. You read one or more model objects, which you're locating with where or with some other more sophisticated query. You potentially make some changes to them. And then you say save, and you reflect all of those objects back to the database. Let's summarize what we just did. So to summarize what we just did, we identified that there is a class method where that selects objects based on attributes. My class, in this case, was the movie class, which corresponds to a particular database table that has uh, columns for movie title, movie rating, and movie release date. By the way, where did the method implementation come from? How is it that the where method sort of exists in my movie class? It's because we inherited from the application record class that's provided by Rails. And all of this functionality is essentially built into any class that is a model backed by a database table. Right? So all of the functionality for sort of connecting your model to the database is part of what Rails provides you uh, in the active record subsystem. We saw that when you do a query that results in zero or more results, the thing you get back quacks like an enumerable. You can do anything to it that you would reasonably expect to do to an enumerable, and it will just work. So we were able to find things by a specific rating. We could actually do more complex queries where we either construct SQL in place or have Ruby constructed for us. What you should not do in general is try to construct things with string interpolation yourself, because this is one of the classic attacks called SQL injection that we will talk about when we cover security in a much later chapter. But again, another reason to let Active Record do most of the work for you is it will avoid common mistakes and it will allow you to chain queries together so that when you finally do your query, it's optimized. And you can do this even for complex multi-way joins, as we'll see 
when uh, in module five, we talk about associations. So that's basically a whirlwind tour of the first bit of active record. Next, we're going to talk about actually the creation of these objects, how you update them. We're going to look at the other operations. So far, all we've really looked at is the read operation in terms of find, but we have not yet looked at create or update or delete, and we'll do those next.